seriously, we do have uh, 45 minutes of discussion time set aside at the end of this session. So if I cut you off, please uh, do keep your question in mind. All right. Uh, although there were, have been a few previews of this work that I'm going to present, here it is. Uh, I'm going to show you what I would like to call percolator model of molten powder planetary nebulae. Percolator because it reminds me of coffee. Coffee smells nice, so you might every time you smell some coffee or have a coffee, you might remember this. You might hate me after a short time for that, but anyway. Uh, this is based on a paper that just appeared in the monthly notices. <coughs> okay. 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 Alright, short time after we had just messy point spreads functions, a few of the PPNs started to show messy outflows with many fingers and, and so on, multipolar, planetary, or pre planetary. Maybe. And uh, okay, okay, the previous. Did I skip something? Yes, 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 yes. yes, that one. Okay. Well, in, in the few decades ago, the planetary nebulae were explained by basically two evolving models an uh, interacting wind model, first spherical, and then <coughs> with the enhancement, the generalization, I mean, something a high density in the equatorial region that would shape the planetary nebulae to bipolars or ellipticals. And uh, then we got this, which of course did not fit to those models. And uh, the usual suspects for anything elongated is of course jets that come from some central engine, like we have in AGNs. Active galactic nuclei here. This is an AGN illustration where you have a disk and jets coming out and doing all sorts of things to the end of the And of course, suggestions immediately came that uh, there were jets that might be precessing and be ejected mostly after some intervals, then you get these multipolar objects. Now we'd like to change. So I will make a suggestion for naming things like jets, like in AGNs, active galactic nuclei. Okay, why don't we call these APNs, right? Like active planetary nuclei. And so maybe we can stick to this acronym for this conference in case of jets remain everywhere. Okay, but then again, jets are not everything. We heard about uh, that photodissociation regions can also produce multipolar jets, mostly slow ones. The jets are good for fast stuff. Here we have slow ejections or, or carvings into the ambient medium that would produce these fingers. Here's an illustration of what this might look like when you shine light through them. If there's dust around, this is dust reflection on such a, an object. And, but there are these <coughs> nice little spheres around some of the stars that aren't planetary nebulae yet. And they look quite innocent, but they are not totally, they might be nice and round, but they are clumpy and filamentary. That is not so innocent, you can do a lot with that. Because that ch changes a lot of things. It reminded me of work that we did uh, some time ago, has been shown already, where we had uh, wind spherical winds going through a collection of clumps, very concentrated clumps, that we used to explain uh, linear increase of velocities as a function of radius. But the essential ingredient was that the velocity of, you can't read that probably, but anyway, velocity of the shock that is produced in one of the clumps or the ambient medium is proportional to the ratio or square root of the ratio of the densities. So if you have distribution, complex distribution of densities, then you can get complex structures. So let's generalize the generalized model. You might call it the even more generalized interacting with model or something like that. If 
we have a spherical initial distribution, but with increased or variety of densities, rounded with holes in it or a half holes in low density regions and high density regions, then what happens if we want a jet or if not a jet or not a jet? It's not a jet. It's a spherical isotropic fast wind through it, then we get something like that. In the, in the low density regions, fingers will appear, the shock propagates faster than in the high density regions. And okay, we have now this uh, high dynamic module in shape, and there we have this nice facility to produce filamentary textures, that is, density distributions where you have very complicated uh, random structures. The size of these structures you can control, and the contrast of density between the, the voids and the filaments you can also control, of course. So we use that to make simulations of this scenario, cutting out of a, a cube, this little sphere, to produce a filamentary, uh, inhomogeneous shell where we initialize the wind, spherical wind, and run it through. You get this. Depending on the size of the structures, you get different finger size, of course, sizes. And here the, the voids are bigger compared to the radius of the, the initial shell, and here they are smaller. So two effects, you get maybe big fingers or asymmetric planetaries. And as you go towards smaller, Voids, the fingers become smaller and the, the, the sphere or the, the shell at itself as a whole expands faster because the wind pushes also the density parts. Here the shells remain smaller because the fingers uh, are much faster. So you can produce images of say the red, here is cold gas, meaning optically visible gas and the, the bluish uh, like is simulated x-rays. Okay, this looks quite similar to what we have in the observations, so that seems to be a, quite a nice explanation for these rather uh, interesting features. You will object, of course, these are all going into random directions, while we are seeing, obviously, uh, pairs of ejections. Please ask me, during the discussion about that. Maybe I don't have time to get into that. Let's see. <coughs> now, our main goal was whether we could explain these secondary lobes <coughs> when there are already primary bipolar structures existing that might uh, vent or, or provoke, uh, avoid the, the formation of these secondary lobes as we observe in these two objects. There are really nice lobes here coming out of the equatorial regions. You could imagine that the big globes actually are like, they prevent, let's say they are, they are like exhaust sort of pressure that might prevent the formation of the secondary lobes. So we tried that. And uh, of course, learning from the old ideas, we simply generalized our model a bit further, making the equatorial regions denser, what we get. After a few trials that uh, wouldn't do what we wanted, but they did other things that weren't that bad after all, so we, we got a nice reproduction of, of that kind of objects where we have fingers that go predominantly into uh, bipolar directions, but there are still these long fingers and we get this nicely reproduced. The key part here is that you have strong cooling <coughs> Strong mass loss and high cooling. So these jets, ooh, jets, yeah, these are jets collimated far from the central regions. These are not APN jets. These are, well, let's find a name for them. I don't know yet. But they are jets that are collimated at the extended uh, spherical envelope. Okay, after some more trial and error, we really got our goal. Here's our uh, bipolar nebula with the secondary lobes compared to the original uh, nebulae, observed nebulae. And there's 
features that we, what we had done at a, a morphopneumatic model, which shaped some time ago of the Hubble 5, and we had found that some of the secondary lobes actually are half low because they're superimposed on the main lobes, and we got similar structures in our, in our simulations and filaments lower density filaments that go up into the lobes and are these stones that you can see here. So that's what we got and so we're very happy that uh, this nice model idea worked out fine. Okay, how much time? Two minutes? Great. Now, I got thinking about this, you know, first objection is of course bipolar, multipolar rejection. And the uh, first thing is that we have to remember these are projected images. In, even if we have a random distribution, if we project this in two dimensions, the likelihood, the probability that two of these lobes are in opposite directions increases because of the projection effect. I mean, you could have two, you won't see that very well, going, one is going to the front and the other one goes right down. They're not aligned, but in projection they are exactly aligned. So it increases that likelihood. However, still, what if the if this is a star just before the last uh, blowing out this, this envelope, last minute before blowing out this envelope, it is convective and it has these convection cells. So I thought maybe these convection cells could have some uh, resonance or some effect that makes them align somehow to some degree. So there could be convection cells, one here, a big cell, and a big cell at the other end that are aligned for some reason because of rotation or some resonance with binaries around and these structures are imprinted into the shell that moves out and later sits there and is uh, uh, interacted with the fast wind. So, I, since I don't have the tools, academic or technical tools, to prove any of that, if that's possible or not, I spoke to a few people, I include, this included Vincent Icke, and he immediately told me, yeah, we did it all before, or had thought about it too, maybe not in this uh, context exactly, but he pointed me to, and he had it there, some images and animations that uh, showed this effect. Let's see if we can see this. Now, this is a, is a, a, a mode, an oscillation mode, where convection goes out here, goes all the way around, and then predominantly makes it bipolar, <laughs> the structure, basically, just from the convection, convective end mode. You could have more modes like that, which then might be able to imprint this multipolar structure with opposing lobes into this envelope and then we see this later on. That's just an idea to pick up and, and work on if somebody has the intellectual capability to do it. I, I will. Thank you. Shells, the thing that you know, if you look at the AGB shells before anything happens, do you see the needed density contrast? I have no idea. That, I, I just thought of maybe that's a possibility how it happens. I mean, you might have a small initial density contrast, which then, by some instability, magic, or whatever, turns into a high density contrast. Because the density contrast really has to be quite high. How much? I'm sorry, how much? 50. So, I don't know, but I just wanted to throw this idea at everybody. <coughs> Let's see what happens. Did, did you say, sorry if I missed, did you say that some of the features are illumination early on in your talk? Uh, many of these features are illumination, so would they mention, change? but not all. Not all, but if they, if they are, would they change over reasonably short times? And do we ever see? Months or years? Well, we have seen what can happen with the illumination in, in this stingray nebula two days ago. Right. See, I, I think but it's not very that can happen. I, I, I'm sure that it's happen. Martin, do you have a question? One, one quick question for Martin. Uh, 
Do you have any prediction as to the kinematics of those kind of dogs in the starfish impact? Yes, yes. They are quite fast, depending on, on the density contrast. Say again? No, they are not fast. They are not fast. I mean, in the model, they should be quite fast. But it, it all depends on how fast you make your wing, what, you know, the conditions. You can make any, from the model, you can make any speed. But the jets, oh, jets, yeah. Not, it may not be ATN jets. They are fast. They are 100 kilometers per second in, in CRL 618 and others. I don't know the other ones. Are they fast or are they slow? How slow? How slow is slow? It's like 20 or 30 kilometers per second. Yeah, but that's fast compared to the, the uh, molecular dissociation mode. So you need a wind to do it. Oh, so let's make it slow. Okay, so I'll cut off the discussion for now. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, Monica. Michael Cardenas. She'll be telling us about using CryRes VLT high resolution spectroastrometry as a tool in the search for disks and compact structures at the innermost, innermost regions of planetary nebula. Okay. Everybody can listen to me? Okay, well, I apologize for...